Okay, so hello everyone. This is our third meeting of the semester. So our general meeting. Today, we're going to have four guest speakers. So it's going to be the new professor night. Um, so I'm really excited for them to present. Alexis. All right, so just a brief overview of our general meeting information. Um, we have two different types of membership, which is gonna be our active membership and then alternative membership. Um, so you can see the differences here. The main ones are gonna be that the alternative are pe for people who can't really make our meetings every Tuesday or every other Tuesday. Um, you still attend the same amount of events. You have to do 15 volunteer credits instead of 10, and then you pay $25 in dues instead of um, 20 or 15 if you're returning. Um, and then all requirements must be completed by November 9th. And these are our social medias. Um, please follow us, um, especially our YouTube. That's pretty important. All of these videos are recorded and put on there afterwards. Um, so you can go back and reference those. And then we have virtual volunteering opportunities as well as in person, but here are a couple of our virtual ones. We have the letters of encouragement to the San Antonio State Hospital and the Children's Shelter, as well as um, love for the elderly. So one letter would be one credit. Then we have an application that you would download on your phone called Seven Cups. Um, it's free online therapy. You just chat with them. The chats are completely confidential. You just have to send us the timestamps um, of the time that you started talking with them and then the end. The next we have UTSA pantry. Um, one item is one credit. They usually give you a slip at the end whenever you're done donating um, that tells you how many items you donated. And you can just send us a picture of that. And then we have monetary donations. You can send us $6 for one credit and you can do a maximum of six credits. Okay, and so for our in-person volunteering, um, it's, it's kind of the same, but a little bit different. So any in-person counts as double credit. So one hour equals two credits. Our upcoming one is October 2nd. So we're going to go back to the Satellite Center. Uh, for those of you that did go, I got a lot of positive feedback. Um, you basically help out. It's a, a ranch, I believe. So you help out with the stables. You help out um, making everything pretty again. And then you might be able to hang out with the horses. So I will be sending out the sign-up sheet later tonight, or well, Megan will be sending out later tonight. And she will also send it in this uh, Zoom chat. So Megan, you can go ahead and send that link as well. We are selling lemonade this year at Best Fest. So if you're new to UTSA or if you joined when the pandemic started, uh, UTSA does Best Fest every fall semester and then Fiesta every spring semester. And I absolutely love Best Fest and Fiesta. It's a you know big celebration. Um, Best Fest is at the Convocation parking lot and a bunch of organizations go out, we sell, they have rides, they have live concerts. It's a lot of fun. So this is a great opportunity for organizations to make money. Um, so if you want to donate the lemonade packs, we're going to give out one credit for every 12 pack. For more information, you can contact Alexis or I, um, and she will be taking those donations in. And to request volunteer credit, so these are the steps. I'm not gonna go in detail, but you can also look at the YouTube video that I made. Um, I made it a year ago, and then you can also scan this QR code, which takes you to the YouTube video as well. For our remaining general meetings, we still have a look into psychiatry. We are going to have Dr. Ogburn, but um, they're no longer able to join us. So we're going to have another professor. Uh, I forgot their name, but I will announce it once we get the confirmation. And then we're going to have Dr. Scott present and Dr. Lawson, and then we're going to have our end of semester celebration. So we have two more events. Um, the next one's gonna be traveling with psychology. So it's basically how you can turn a psychology degree um, into something that you can travel with, different careers within that. And then our next one after that is gonna be professional development. Um, it's gonna be sort of like a workshop type thing. We're gonna have three guest speakers. And then at the end, they can give you kind of specialized help within writing a CV, personal statement, um, or a resume. 
And these are our remaining socials. So we have chicken and pickle next. It's going to be October 7th. Um, that's two weeks from now. And this one will be in person. I've never gone to chicken and pickle, but I've heard that it's a lot of fun because it's a restaurant and they have lots of games. Um, they have like courts and yeah, it, it sounds like a lot of fun. I saw their website. So if you need rides, we will offer rides. You have to meet at the convo by six um, and we'll give y'all more information as we get closer. And then we have the campus scavenger hunt, which is a three day thing. And we will send out lists daily with things that you need to find or complete. Um, here's just pictures of our merch that are available to buy at the tabling. Um, there's the prices right next to them. We still have a lot of gray shirts left and masks, et cetera. And then you can pay us through Cash App or Venmo, Venmo or you can just give me cash at the tailing event. And then without further ado, um, we have our faculty that we're gonna be, um, that are our guest speakers today. Um, first, we're gonna start with Dr. Denver Brown. Did you want to um, pull up your presentation or did you want me to pull it up? Ah, I can pull it up. Okay. There we go. Yeah, everyone had a nice headshot in there except me with a photo from a friend's wedding. I long reason behind that is because I was supposed to start at UTSA in 2020, but we deferred and came down in 2021 because our son was expected to be born right before the uh, original start date. So we recently just moved here from Canada and I'm now establishing the infant child and youth health lab, which is easily referred to as the inch lab here at UTSA. And I was hired as part of the human performance cluster hire. Um, so I am primarily affiliated with the department of psychology, but I also have a joint appointment in the, de the department of kinesiology. Uh, I'll give a quick shout out that I am recruiting not only undergraduate volunteers to be a part of my lab, um, but also next year I'll be looking for master's students to bring on uh, for a range of different projects, which I'll talk about some of the areas of interest in a second, um, as well as PhD students. So if you know anyone that's interested in looking and, and particularly interested in health among the early life segments, then please reach out. Uh, right now, I'm currently teaching experimental psychology or probably better packaged as research methods. So I think we've been having a lot of fun with that course and using some of the uh, exciting things that are going on in the news to, to really sell why we should be better, not only producers of research as, as psychologists, but also consumers of research. Because across the lifespan, we're always going to need to bring in what we're being told and, and comprehend it quite well. Uh, the other one is really in my wheelhouse uh, in terms of the psychology of physical activity. And this is a, an upper year course that's really looking at how we can understand how to get people more active and the uh, mental health consequences associated with being physically active. Uh, in spring, I'll be teaching experimental psychology again. So if you're interested in taking that one, uh, feel free to sign up. It should be opening soon. If you need to contact me, my email is right here. And you can also find me on Twitter at the Denver Brown. Um, I'm pretty active uh, sharing a lot of things about uh, physical activity research and open science. So feel free to get in touch through there. One second, it's not skipping my slides now. There we go. All right, so the primary primary interest in terms of the inch lab research is really looking at determinants of physical activity behavior among children and youth. Um, so when I say physical activity, we're talking about any movement, whether it's at a light intensity or at that moderate to vigorous intensity, like when we're out playing sports. And most of my work in this area focuses on looking at more contemporary theories that look to help people close that gap that we have between our intentions to be physically active and our behavior. And I know many of us can attest to really struggling with having those, those intentions and, and actually being able to follow through. So um, building from not only looking at our attitudes and subjective norms and perceived behavioral control, a lot of the more recent work is focused on 
how self-regulatory skills like planning, monitoring, and goal setting, and then reflexive processes like habits and identity, how these factors play a role in ultimately determining um, physical activity behavior. And understanding these, we can help to design and develop interventions that can later be implemented and evaluated. A lot of my research recently really focuses on time use epidemiology, and this really looks to look at the interactive impact of movement behaviors, which collectively encompasses not only physical activity, but also sedentary behavior, which um, used to be called physical inactivity, but now has been known to be a, an independent behavior, which would um, be associated with essentially little to no movement, just when you're sitting or in a, a lying supine position, as well as sleep. So looking at how these three factors interact over the course of a 24 hour period to impact health outcomes, and in particular, mental health and well being uh, among children and youth. A lot of this work is really um, instrumental for helping identify populations that might be at risk for poor mental health through using certain analyses like latent class or profile analysis to figure out who has uh, the poorest or least favorable mental health scores, but also the poorest uh, movement behavior combinations, whether it would be very low scores for sedentary behavior or very high scores for sedentary behavior and screen time, as well as very low scores for physical activity. And then understanding a lot of the socio-demographic predictors of these so that we can have more targeted and tailored interventions. Lastly, I am a huge advocate for open science. Um, if you have taken some Psych 101 courses, you know, and they haven't been updated in a while, they probably haven't covered a lot of what's happened in the past 10 years with the open science movement. And there have been plenty of reasons why we now have a lot of biased findings in the literature, and we've had questionable research practices that have been followed for years. And the open science movement and using open science practices within our daily basis or within our research paradigm is something that we can really do to improve the knowledge that we're able to uh, get from the research questions that we're asking. And this can be done through um, being upfront and registering or pre-registering our studies. This can, or as easily as sharing pre-prints and post-prints so that everyone has open access and the information that's largely funded um, through taxpayer dollars isn't hidden behind these paywalls. Uh, this also spans to other things like sharing code, uh, and having open materials related to our, to our research. So if anyone's interested in learning more about how we can get kids active and trying to figure out the mental health consequences of not only our physical activity, but the impact of screen time and sleep as one collective latent construct, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I do have opportunities within my lab coming up in the future, and I'd be more than happy to, to speak with you about these things. Yeah, I definitely agree with Megan. That's a really interesting subject. Um, it's so important too, because I feel like now with the digital age, it's like becoming more, I guess, not really an issue, but, you know, kids are on screens a lot more than, you know, I used to be or they maybe used to be. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, our next presenter, but thank you for that. Um, our next presenter is going to be Dr. Hoop. I hope I said that right. Um, if you want to share your presentation. Sure, no problem. Um, so I, I hear all pronunciations. How is the the way I do it? But I'm okay. Not thank you. Very picky. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, let me see if I can get this working. All right. So uh, I guess my biographical or background details. I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, married to two kids, Sandra and Isaac, who are 11 and nine. <clears throat> uh, my academic background, I actually got a bachelor's degree in math, although I did minor in psychology, uh, including working with a Skinner box in a lab, although mostly I was just feeding pigeons. Um, and then uh, after that, I got a master's degree in artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and then through that process, I really decided I was a lot more interested in, in human psychology and intelligence rather than uh, artificial systems. So in my PhD program, uh, I went back to psychology and cognitive science. 
Uh, before coming here, I was faculty at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio for about eight years. Uh, and I was part of a PhD program in human factors and industrial organizational psychology. Uh, and then um, I guess in addition to, to uh, my work as a professor, I also have a, a sort of side company, Cognitive Modeling Solutions, where I do consulting on some of the research topics that I'm involved with, including for the Air Force uh, and one of the, a couple of the national labs at this point. Um, sort of like Denver, I was brought here as part of a cluster hire. So I was, um, I joined UTSA to be involved with the intersection of psychology and artificial intelligence. Uh, so I've got an appointment in computer science and I'm really interested in how our understanding of psychology can help improve artificial intelligence systems, as well as how uh, modern machine learning techniques and AI can help us understand cognitive and, and psychological processes. Uh, the two kind of subfields of psychology that I, I sit under are uh, one, mathematical psychology. Uh, so the, the driving force here is to try and take tools from mathematics and computation to really quantify our predictions about psychological processes. I put here quantifying cognition because that's the area of cognition and perception the areas I'm most familiar with. Um, but mathematical psychology really spans all of the subtopics of psychology, um, including I sat on a committee this summer, people um, using mathematical models to represent uh, variation over time in bipolar disorder, uh, looking at predictive models for symptomology and, and schizophrenia, uh, up through social processes and things like that as well. Um, I've got sort of a, a couple of, of graphics rather than a pile of equations. Uh, I would say in mathematical psychology, there's a lot more equations than most areas of psychology. Um, but usually when we're trying to communicate it, we try and uh, put that in terms of nice pictures. Uh, and I want to just highlight some of the more influential models here. Uh, oops, it's amazing. Um, so here on the far right, left, I don't know, this side um, is prospect theory. This was actually the only Nobel Prize one uh, awarded in psychology, even though it was in economics, um, to Danny Kahneman um, for research and understanding how we make decisions in, in situations where there's uncertainty. Um, so usually these studies are framed in terms of gambles or which lottery ticket would you want to pick, uh, but it certainly has applications in terms of buying stocks or making business decisions, buying insurance, things like that as well. And so by taking uh, our understanding of how people make decisions and codifying in a mathematical theory, we're able to better make predictions and better integrate that information into to uh, interactions with the world. Um, we do a lot of work with face perception and understanding what it is about our perceptual process that makes us so good at representing faces. Um, so that's an area, for example, even the best state-of-the-art AI systems are pretty bad at recognizing faces uh, and can't deal with things like different um, emotional expressions, variation in lighting conditions, things like that. <clears throat> Um, I don't know why. That's because they're doing the deals. I'll just show them all. Uh, the other area that I'm really involved with is human factor psychology. Um, the tagline there is I think this is from the society, is understanding the human element. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I know we don't have a human factors course here. And uh, if you took intro here, human factors uh, gets about a, a one paragraph uh, sort of homage in the, the textbook, and, and I'm guilty of this too, I teach intro here. Um, but this is, I think, one of the really exciting applications of psychology. So it's really taking our understandings of psychology um, and, and using that to better design environments and understand people's interactions with, with uh, artifacts and, and doing tasks in the environment. Um, so this, this could be, a, a, you know, one of the big areas of this is, um, UX or user experience types of things, uh, you know, being able to design cell phone apps that you can just use right off the bat. Um, there's been, I'd say over the last 20 years, huge improvements in the way we interact with computers from, you know, needing to sit down and read the manual and memorize commands to, you know, just a more intuitive like swiping to get from one page to the next, 
and those kinds of things. And a lot of that comes out of this understanding of, of psychology and psychologists contributing to this research. <clears throat> this can also um, have more mundane applications. So this picture here is what um, we call a Norman door, uh, named after Don Norman. Um, He's a well-known human factor psychologist, uh, and in fact, has been a consultant and maybe even an employee of Apple for a number of years. Um, <clears throat> but he collects images of these doors that they basically make it hard to figure out how to open it. So I think many of us have had this experience of walking up to a door, and even if it says push, trying to pull on it. Um, and the way Norman talks about these is you put this signal here on the door of a handle. <clears throat> Sorry. I, just lectured, uh, so I'm losing my voice apparently. Um, but the idea is this handle uh, makes us think pull. So when we walk up to that door, even though it says push there, that takes more effort when we want to pull the door. And so the idea here is that uh, by using our understanding of psychology and, and our how we interact with the environment, we can better design doors so we don't have people yanking on doors that are supposed to be pushed or smacking into a door thing gives a push when it's a pull door. And we can do that through um, basically designing things. So if I put like a flat panel here that I couldn't grasp, then it's gonna make it much more obvious to me that I need to push. In the same way, putting a handle on it signifies pulling. Um, this one, so I talked about some of the research with the Air Force. You know, so one of the things they're interested in is we move towards um, not having a single pilot for a single ve uh, vehicle. Uh, what's the best way to interface between that pilot and those vehicles, as well as uh, wondering whether we can move to a point where the vehicles are sort of smart enough to do most of the navigating on their own, so you could have a single pilot uh, controlling multiple vehicles. Um, you know, and I think some uh, really neat demonstrations of this are, are some of like the light shows and things you see with drones. Uh, this, this last example here is a, a program I've worked on a little bit. Um, looking at uh, command and control situations. So this would be if there's a, an emergency situation where you have multiple different uh, groups showing up, uh, and you might need to coordinate between the police and the fire department or, or uh, other agencies involved uh, and looking at design for the best way to communicate information uh, at that sort of central level, as well as across groups. Do you mind if I just rinse my hand super quick? Yes. Do you mind? I really, I'm sorry. I know I'm kind of like in your way. No. I don't think that's Like disinfectant wipes in the morning. Uh, can you yeah. mute yourself to Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of the more, more general areas of mathematical psychology and human factors. Um, Drilling down into some of the studies I've done, so looking at spatial awareness in virtual environments. In this particular study, we're looking at how virtual, uh, a virtual sound environment uh, can help us keep track of where we are as we move around in an, an impoverished environment. So certainly we, we rely a lot on vision for navigation and understanding where we are as we move through an environment. Um, but even uh, people with normal vision still rely to some degree on the soundscape to understand where they are. So this project was about developing and understanding the contribution of sound to our, our spatial awareness. <clears throat> in fact, the, the lead researcher on this project just left the Air Force, this is an Air Force project from tell that sort of military-ish designs uh, is now working at Oculus. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just results. Um, uh, Another uh, design kind of question I've worked on was looking at multi-sensor displays. So um, in some surveillance environments, um, you get these uh, regular visual cameras and then infrared cameras that carry fairly different types of information. Um, in this case, I think the information is, is fairly redundant, but that can be different for different situations. Um, and uh, if the goal is somebody needs to to use both of those sorts of information, the default assumption was that you would need to create a fused image of taking both sources and, and collapsing them into one. So a lot of effort was on the computer science side for creating these algorithms for making a single image out of both of those. In our studies, it turned out um, people are just much better with the two separate sources of information and are more effective at extracting that information. Uh, so our recommendation back up to, to people working on these systems is you know it's, it's fine if you want to include 
this information with the fused image. Um, but really, for, for effective communication of that information, you need to have the raw data as well. Uh, and that's just kind of what that did look like. Other uh, sort of earlier stage projects that I'm working on is uh, looking at visual expertise and identifying melanoma. Uh, so the normal way uh, we might look at melanoma is you see those ABCD rules in your, your doctor's office things like area, border, uh, color consistency, uh, those kinds of things that might be cues to whether some, some feature on your skin or, or nevi or lesion uh, is something that you need to worry about. Um, however, uh, the way professional dermatologists uh, deal with these things is based on visual expertise. They basically look and say, oh, that looks odd, we should get that biopsy. And so this project is on uh, leveraging actually um, computer vision systems to help train people to be better visual experts in looking at these things. Uh, and that way you might be able to have a primary care physician or a, a, a nurse practitioner that's more likely to be seeing more people be able to kind of like, oh, by the way, that thing on your arm looks kind of funny once you get that checked out. Um, so having that perceptual expertise that they could use to refer on up to, to term, dermatologists. Um, Another project we have going on is, is quantifying um, variation, the ability to, uh, or really variation in the extent to which people take care of word context into effect from reading uh, across uh, dyslexic and non-dyslexic groups. Um, the, for any of you that are familiar with this, dyslexia diagnosis is kind of a mess. There are four or five different criteria that can be used. Um, all of them tend to be very expensive. Uh, so application, you know, and it, and it tends to be if dyslexia is picked up, it has to be in the school environment. But you have to be in a school environment that has the financial ability to do these diagnostics. Um, otherwise, it ends up being, you know, maybe the family can spend the money on the test, but that can be thousands of dollars. And so our goal here is to target some of those fundamental processes and these quantitative mathematical models uh, to get fairly specific uh, and yet uh, fairly easy to run and robust diagnostics for dyslexia. Uh, it looks like that's the stuff I have prepared. So I think I ate up that extra time that Denver had saved for us. So apologies for that. Yeah, it's no problem. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, for the sake of time, we're going to move on to Dr. Hill. Thank you. Do you all have my slides? You can see them? Great. Yep, um, yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm also one of the new faculty, um, and I lead the suicide prevention research team here at UTSA. Uh, we're just getting our team up and running here. Um, like everyone else, I'll give you just a, a bit of my background. So I did my undergraduate training at the University of Michigan uh, back in, uh, I started in suicide prevention there in about 2007. Um, and then I went down to uh, Florida International University for my graduate training um, and then came out to Texas. I, once, once I went to a warm state, I couldn't go back to the cold states. Uh, so I, I came out this way uh, and I've spent the last four years at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital where I was doing a mixture of research, a little bit of clinical work, clinical supervision. Uh, so I'm coming at this from a very applied perspective, having spent the last uh, couple of years uh, sort of mixing research and uh, clinical work with children and adolescents. Uh, right now I'm teaching two sections of introduction to psychology, um, but next semester I will also be teaching developmental psychopathology. So if anyone's interested, um, check that out. Um, hopefully that'll be an interesting course. Um, it'll be really sort of designed for those of you who are sort of juniors and seniors um, and are getting ready for the more advanced courses. Uh, but the suicide prevention research team, um, our, our goal is to advance suicide prevention through psychological science. Uh, and I keep our goal nice and broad because we, we do studies on a lot of different things. Uh, I tend to be interested by anything involving suicide prevention. Um, but our primary studies tend to revolve around three main areas. Uh, so first is just improving our understanding of suicide related behaviors. How do they develop? Why do they develop? Um, why do some people have suicidal thoughts and other people don't? Uh, why do some people have suicidal thoughts but never act on them while other people will go on to make attempts? 
those are the kinds of questions that we spend a lot of our time asking. Um, also, we like to develop and test a novel suicide prevention program. So how can we get prevention out to the community um, so that more people have access to services or to prevent people from getting to the level where they need um, individual therapy with a psychologist? If we can treat problems earlier on, uh, we, we try to move prevention in that direction. And then our third area of focus is really around improving the quality of suicide prevention within the community. Uh, so making sure that our community providers are using evidence-based programs and practices and that those, those evidence-based programs get disseminated widely. Um, and then sort of across all of this, my focus has always been on youth and young adult populations. So middle school, high school and college age uh, folks, um, as well as on um, LGBTQ youth um, or other sort of high risk groups. And I thought what I would do is just share a couple of the studies that we're either working on or planning uh, to hopefully launch sometime soon. Um, so the first is what we are calling the Geospatial Identification of Elevated Suicide Risk or Geyser. Uh, this is uh, in collaboration with Texas Children's Hospital over in Houston. Um, and a few years ago, Texas Children started screening um, any adolescent who came through their emergency room for suicide risk. So they have three hospitals with three emergency rooms and every teenager who comes through gets a, a brief suicide risk, risk survey. Uh, and so what this project is doing is taking all of that data and there's something like 30,000 completed screens um, and plotting them, mapping them based on census tracts. So which, which census tracts sort of get down to the neighborhood level. Um, and then using that data and other data from the community to try and better understand what makes a community sort of more or less likely to have youth who are having suicidal thoughts. So are there particular hot spots in the community where like, oh, in this neighborhood, there's more people who are having suicidal thoughts than we would expect. And what is it about that community that might be leading to that? Um, so we're doing data, we're, we're doing things like pulling locations of all of the parks or all of the uh, churches and houses of worship or all of the cafes and sort of looking at what are the aspects of a community that make it better or worse uh, in terms of um, youth having thoughts of suicide. Um, in the area of um, testing new prevention programs, uh, we've developed two interventions over the last few years um, that are both brief sort of web-based modules that people can complete on their own. They were both developed for teenagers. So we had LEAD, which is um, all about addressing the thought of being a burden on others or that other people would be better off without you. Um, and then we have SGT, which stands for Supporting Grieving Teens. That one was originally designed for youth who had lost a loved one, but the focus of the intervention is really around building your social support network, connecting with other people, developing relationships. And so what we're looking to do with these is um, maybe adapt them for use with college students um, to see if we can, you know, we need to sort of dial up the, the level of them a little bit because college students are obviously more advanced than 13 year olds and you can do more complicated things. Um, so finding sort of the right level for college students um, and then down the road, what we'd like to create is um, this sort of larger screening program where you could log into a website, answer a few questions about yourself, and then the website would sort of push back to you, hey, here's the areas where um, you seem to be under a little bit of pressure. You're really stressed right now. Here's a stress reduction program. Uh, you've reported being sort of lonely lately. Here's a program to help you build relationships. Um, so that's sort of what we're working toward down the road is this ability to direct people to brief interventions that they can do on their own without having to go in and get a therapist um, so that we can reserve therapists for the folks who really need them. Because uh, if you've ever tried to get therapy for anything, you know that there's often a weeks or months long waiting list um, and we're just not gonna solve the problem by training more and more therapists. Uh, we need to do a combination of things. And then the last area that we're working on right now is um, asking questions about how we can improve the quality of education in suicide prevention. So does training in different evidence-based practices actually result in changes in clinician behavior? Uh, does the type of training matter, right? With, um, with COVID, everybody put their trainings online and then realized that they could record them. So now people are just trying to use pre-recorded training, but is that as effective for teaching some of these complex clinical skills? Um, or do we really need to have live trainings with, with experts in the room to answer complicated questions. 
uh, and to help studies around, uh, around that question. And then finally, we have we always have lots of things going on. So a couple of UTSA undergrads, uh, Blake and Zane, have joined the lab, um, and they're working on a paper around ethics and suicide prevention. We're also looking at whether online uh, programs can improve college students' knowledge about suicide. Uh, I'm working with um, Elena, who is um, a postdoctoral fellow back at Baylor College of Medicine, looking at um, how to help connect youth to mental health services after they make a suicide attempt. Uh, and Paige is a graduate student at LSU um, over in Louisiana, who's working on uh, impulsivity and something called negative urgency, which is this idea that if I have a negative emotion, I have to get rid of it right now. Like I have to do something to cope with my negative emotions and whether or not that might make people more likely to self-injure um, or think about suicide. So lots of projects going on all the time, always looking for new students and new ideas. And right now we are recruiting, uh, whether you wanna uh, come into the lab as a volunteer, maybe uh, do an independent study or join us uh, next year as a graduate student. Um, if you'd like more information, there's my email. Um, and that QR code will take you straight to our lab application if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the QR code. That is really, I just opened it right now. Very cool. And it's such important research. Um, we'll move on. Thank you for presenting. Uh, we'll move on to the, ne um, the next presenter and the last one, which is going to be Dr. Mecca. Hey everyone, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here to get started. Um, I do wanna give a quick little warning that at any moment I may have my baby girl come in and uh, crash this uh, interactive session. Um, I'm hoping that she doesn't realize I'm in my office. Uh, so I, I make no promises on that. Oh, I, I'm sure I'll get bonus points for cuteness uh, for that. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real big honor to be able to talk a little bit about my work. And because it is Hispanic Heritage Month, I feel obliged to also say it in Spanish. Gracias por tenerme aquí. Estoy muy encantado para hablar de mi estudio que estoy haciendo aquí at UTSA. Um, so I'm here to talk about my research lab, uh, similar to uh, Dr. Hill and Dr. Brown. Uh, we, I just started here at UTSA this fall, so I have a new faculty here at UTSA. Uh, however, I was a former faculty at Old Dominion University, uh, where the TARDIS lab, which is the team on acculturation, risk, and the development of identity and self uh, was really well established. So as I've transitioned here to UTSA, I've been starting to uh, reestablish the TARDIS uh, project uh, and the variety of studies that we conduct. So before I talk about what we do in TARDIS, I want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, as some of you may be guessed, I am a second generation Hispanic immigrant. Uh, my dad came to the United States in his 30s from Cuba. He escaped on the Maliad as a political refugee uh, following the Cuban Castro regime. Uh, my mom came when she was 16 from Uruguay um, without any formal education and dropped out of high school in part because she wasn't welcomed uh, within the United States. Um, so I grew up from very humble beginnings. I remember going to McDonald's on, on Sundays and like stocking up on the 20 cents uh, hamburgers and 39 cents cheeseburgers. Um, I, like many of you, I am a first generation college student. I'm the first person in my family to go to college, let alone get a PhD. Um, so I resonate with a lot of you who recently had to learn how to fill out FAFSA applications and potentially some of you realizing how poor you actually were. Uh, which was a realization I had when I did my FAFSA applications and I started doing my applications for high school, I mean for college. Um, just a little bit about background. Um, I am born and raised in Miami, Florida. Um, I lived there the majority of my life to this day. Um, I did my bachelor's degree at Florida International University, uh, where I became a McNair Fellow uh, towards the end of my uh, tenure there. Um, and shortly after that, my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer, so I decided to stay local in Miami, and I did my master's in developmental psychology, and then eventually my PhD in developmental psychology at Florida International University. So actually, Dr. Hill and I both started FIU at the same time. Uh, we we're part of the same cohort, although he was in the clinical program, and I was in the developmental program. Um, shortly after that, uh, because I really did not want to leave my family, and I had just met my wife, uh, then girlfriend, 
Um, I did a, a postdoctoral position at the University of Miami in public health within the Miller School of Medicine. So my research is very interdisciplinary. It draws on uh, developmental science as the overarching focus, but I also draw a lot on social psychology, on personality psychology, on public health, on epidemiology, on human developmental and family systems, on clinical psychology, counseling psychology, et cetera. And very broadly, my research is focused on identity development and its general function, as well as links to health behavior. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. So um, just to give you a broad overview of what is identity, because uh, I often get asked by this, even by uh, people who are scholars in, in psychology, like, what do you mean when you talk about identity? And, and the simplest definition that I often use to describe it is, people's explicit or implicit response to the question, who are you? And this actually is word for word from one of the leading textbooks right now uh, in this field. Now, when we look at how a lot of people have talked about identity, uh, there's this common understanding that identity represents a very complex woven quilt. What we mean by that is when we talk about our own individual identity, we're talking about an identity that's extremely multifaceted. There are multiple aspects to who I am as an individual. So I have multiple identities, if you will, that can and do coexist. Some of the aspects are particularly relevant. So right now, me giving this presentation, my identity as an assistant professor, as a scholar, as a researcher, as a teacher, as a mentor is particularly salient. If my daughter walks into the room, I am no longer any of those things. I'm a father, right? Potentially a husband too, if my wife walks in. Um, so the, what is relevant depends on the context and the situation, although broadly being both a scholar and a father are important to my general sense of who I am. And we often see that identities interact and intersect with each other, sometimes in, way that are, sometimes in ways that are harmonious. Uh, so for example, when I became a father, my identity as a scholar, as a researcher, as a teacher heightened because I had a new motivation to do the work that I was doing, to create a better world for my daughter. That was part of my new motivation as a father. But other identities sometimes are in conflict. Um, so for example, sometimes, although not often, my identity as a scholar and researcher can be in conflict with my identity as a teacher and instructor, where do I have enough time to create the coolest class ever versus having to design the coolest study ever? And there's kind of a trade-off and conflict that sometimes can emerge between these identities, right? Um, and other times they just don't interact at all and they're completely tangential. They're not related whatsoever in any way, shape or form. So if I had to describe my identity, this actually came from my talk that I did last year at UTSA here as part of my quote unquote job talk. Um, this is me at the center. And then here are some of the aspects that are important to who I am. So I, I'm a husband and I'm a geek, a huge geek. I love video games and Dungeons and Dragons. I, I named my lab the TARDIS lab after Doctor Who, in case any of you didn't get that reference. Huge geek here. Uh, I'm a scholar, I'm a researcher. Uh, I'm Hispanic, Latinx. Uh, I'm a father. And all of these are relative identities. Uh, their size denotes how much I've thought about these identities. So being a geek and gamer, I've been a geek and gamer since I was a little kid. I've had a lot of time to explore what that means to me. Being a father, I, my daughter's three. I haven't had a lot of time yet to think about what this means, but it's really close to who I am because it's a really important component to my general sense of self. In contrast, sports, um, I'm showing this here so you can see it. It really should be microscopic. I, I don't care about sports whatsoever. Like I have no team that I care about. I don't have a sport that I care about. Um, Denner and I are never going to bond over like, you know, hockey or football or anything like that. Um, even the idea of just going out to a park seems alien to me if it isn't for the fact that my daughter does like running around for no reason. So this is kind of what the challenge of the TARDIS lab is. It's trying to understand identity development across all of this. And it's a really cool challenge. As a developmentalist, I love complexity. I love nuance. I love contextualism. So I love being able to do this research. But obviously, the research agenda needs a specific focus. And really, what our research agenda has focused on is these three specific areas of identity with some work that does other stuff. So we dedicate a large percentage of the work that we do on cultural identity. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. 
But a good component of that is work on ethnic racial identity, our identity as members of our specific ethnicity or race. And a lot of this work has focused around ethnic racial minorities. We've also done a lot of work on acculturation, which in my mind is an identity process. It's the process by which immigrants transition into a new culture. And this extends into the children of immigrants who not only have to become American and acquire whatever being American means, the culture, practices, and identity, but also have to learn what it means to be a member of their heritage. So as a second generation immigrant, I don't know what it meant to be Cuban. I didn't know what it meant to be Uruguayan. And it's not like they, both of them were the same thing. They had two different cultural practices, behaviors that I had to learn growing up while also being American and whatever that means. So it's a process of navigating these cultural streams which entails identity processes. We've also done some stuff around parenting identity. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, more recently, we've been working some stuff on pathological identity, and we actually hope to collaborate with Dr. Hill a little bit about that. And then we've been doing some stuff around academic identity, in part because of the prevalent uh, educational disparities we see within uh, the United States higher education system. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these areas, these three big areas. So like I said, a majority of my work has focused on cultural identity. Uh, and cultural identity represents how individuals define themselves in relation to the cultural groups to which they belong to. Um, a lot of that work has focused on ethnic or racial identity, but we've also done some stuff on uh, American and US identity and how, what it means for you to be American and how much thought and exploration you've done on that. Uh, some of the work that we have moving forward is gonna be looking to better understand how cultural identity development occurs, particularly in adolescents and young adults. And a lot of this work focuses on ethnic racial minorities, as well as immigrant populations. We're particularly interested in how cultural identity is related to things. And that's really why I do this work. We tend to see that individuals who have a strong understanding of who they are in terms of their ethnicity and race tend to have higher well-being, tend to be more, less likely to engage in risky behavior, tend to do better in school, tend to be more likely to be buffered against the negative effects of discrimination, they tend to do better. So understanding the processes that lead to why some people have a strong ethnic racial identity and others don't is important from a prevention and intervention perspective. And understanding what are some of the age specific and contextual factors that contribute to ethnic racial identity. Growing up in Miami, I really never cared too much about being Hispanic Latino because Miami was a large ethnic enclave where everyone was Hispanic Latino and the majority of the political and economic power was housed within that population. Being a minority wasn't important to who I was until I left FIU, until I went to my first academic conference. And the moment I got off the plane, I suddenly wanted croquetas and cafe con leche. Like I was like, oh my God, I'm a minority here. So our identities are tied to these contextual factors and better understanding that is a critical component for understanding how we can initiate positive development. Like I said, some of my work has also focused on acculturation, which from an identity perspective is the change that occurs as a result of contact with people from a different culture. More often than not, acculturation is studied within the context of immigration, but it's not limited to immigration. You go through acculturation if you visit France for a few weeks. Uh, it's whenever you make contact with a culture that's dissimilar. So the work that we have here is obviously focused mainly on first, but also on second generation immigrants and better understanding how acculturation occurs, particularly centered around the ideas of biculturalism, this idea that it's not one or the other, you can be both, you can be a Hispanic American, you can be a Mexican American, Cuban American, you can be an Iranian American, whatever it is, you can adopt both your heritage, you can retain your heritage culture and adopt the culture of the host society, in this case, the United States. I've also been interested in specific stressors that immigrant groups tend to experience, and ethnic racial minorities also tend to experience this as well. Uh, some of these stressors, for example, like discrimination and negative context and reception are rooted in xenophobia and systemic racism that have been prevalent throughout the history of this country. And as a context of reception can impact how much we adopt the, her the US host culture or not, as well as how much we reject or don't reject our heritage culture. There's also stressors associated with this balancing act of, uh, you know, again, as a second generation, being American enough to be viewed as American, being Hispanic enough to not be called the gringo by my relatives, right? 
Uh, so having to walk this line of walking both these cultural worlds can sometimes be stressful. So I've been really interested in how those stressors impact acculturation and health outcomes. And then, like I said, we've done some work uh, focused on around other areas of identity. So I've done some work on the transition to parenthood after I became a father. So this is a picture of my wife and I with our baby girl when she was just born. Uh, again, she's now three. Um, I've done some work focusing right now on first generation college students and what it means to be first generation as an identity component. And this is with work with one of my students, Kelsey Allison, who's still at Old Dominion University. I've done some work with college athletes and the, uh, the, uh, what it means to be an athletic identity, having an athletic identity in the context of one's scholarship identity. And actually, Dr. Brown and I are hoping to collaborate on this. We'll be meeting this Friday to talk about that. So I'm really excited. Uh, and I've also done some work on veteran populations and the transition to civilian life, hence the, the here going from the, the fatigues to the civilian clothes. Uh, and some of the work on what it means to have a military identity and whether it's adaptive within the context of transitioning to civilian life. So in terms of getting involved, uh, I'm almost always looking for recruits. Um, uh, we do a variety of different topics. So if you were to join my research lab, we prepare IRB applications, you do literature reviews, help create surveys, enter data, less on entry data nowadays, most of it's digital, but uh, we clean and code data, analyze it. Uh, I do engage in manuscript preparation, even with my undergraduate students. Um, and then in terms of what we are interested in, there is no GPA requirement, uh, there is no major requirement, and there is no course requirement. So you could be a freshman and join the TARDIS lab. What we are looking for is students whose interests are aligned with what the TARDIS is focused on. So I wanna see your passion, your interest for the work that we are doing within your application. We're interested in people who are committed to working with us for a lengthy period of time. So although we would love to be able to have a person for just one semester and contribute to the lab, it's really more beneficial for you as a research assistant and for us as a lab, if you're able to work with us for an extended period, for a year, two, maybe even three years you're gonna get most out of that experience. And given the work that we do with marginalized populations, we're interested in people who have a strong, and I can't emphasize this enough, a strong commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. This is a core value for the TARDIS. And also all are welcome, but I may put special preference for anyone who's a geek. So if you reference Marvel Cinematic Universe, Doctor Who, Harry Potter, you know, I may just win you a few extra points, but that's besides the point. Uh, so here's my contact email. You can email me at alan.mecca at utsa.edu. We have a lab email account, the TARDIS at, uh, TARDIS at, at utsa.edu. Uh, here's the QR code for our Qualtrics application. We are accepting applications. Uh, we're going to be doing first review of our applications that we received uh, this uh, Sunday. So if you are interested in having priority consideration, please submit your application by this Sunday. We will be emailing candidates for interviews uh, early in October to select candidates for the lab. And then follow us on our social media. We have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account. I think one of my students created an Instagram, but I have no idea what that information is because I don't really use Instagram, but you know, it's somewhere and that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Mecca. A lot of uh, interesting and useful information. Um, your lab is really cool. I've also watched Dr. Who, so that's pretty interesting. <laughs> um, we're gonna open it up to Q&A now. We have about five minutes or as long as the guest speakers wanna stay, um, you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat. I know Debbie already has the top one for Dr. Hill, or you can say it in person if you just wanna raise your hand. Also, don't forget to sign out for this meeting to get credit. So I have one question. It's more like, I just wanna know what your experience was like being a new professor during the pandemic. I know we have a lot of new students that joined during the pandemic as well. So what was that like for y'all? I'm happy to go, but I'll defer to the, the newer new professors uh, since I, I transitioned from the position already. 
Yeah, so I, I guess I'm the most junior on the block here. This is my first assistant professor job. But uh, yeah, so it, it was definitely a complicated situation. I, I moved from Canada, so immigrating to a new country was no easy feat, let alone with uh, a 15 month old. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's been tough because I haven't been able to meet new people and expand my network aside from, you know, meeting Ryan and Alan at at our ever everlasting orientation it felt like so it was good to good to meet them and spend some extended time with them then but you know it's it it has been challenging but there have been there have been highlights through it as well and it's nice to slowly get some some more normality in the world also moving from canada everything was locked down so coming here we're actually able to do stuff and go outside you can get non-essentials in a grocery store so that's nice too I keep getting the commercials about Canada being open now. So that's like, I love those commercials, especially when they're coming from the airport with the baby. I think it's so cute. But yeah, how are you liking San Antonio in comparison to Canada? Love it. It's going to be warm all year round. The only tough thing is that our dog is still in Canada because it was too hot on the tarmac to bring him down in the middle of the summer. So soon he'll be down here. What? <laughs> This because if you just want to talk in okay yeah you couldn't be separated from your dog for like a day without you freaking yeah i have five dogs and i hate being without them for like even an hour so Oh, the I guess I'll, I'll jump in on that um so for me the the transition has also been difficult just um, relocating during the summer. Uh, uh, thankfully, after we had gotten vaccines, vaccinated also. That, that was, I think, the only saving grace. But uh, um, everything has just been slower. I think just the adjustment compared to like my previous position. Um, and one of the things that I think rough for me, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm very student centered. And I, as much as I've been taking precautions uh, in teaching online, etc., I miss being in a lecture. I miss Let everything. Go. Um, mm -hmm. I. Hey, hey, little one. <laughs> I kind of want to drag my daughter now and just like have her, the two kids in your eye. Um, but yeah, I miss, I miss being in a lecture hall. I'm looking forward to once my daughter gets vaccinated um, to be able to lecture again in person. So are all of you teaching virtually right now or are some of you doing some in person? I'm in person. Uh, with both sections of intro to site. Yeah, I personally like virtual. I just feel like it's easier for me to grasp the information that's being taught. But I know there's a lot of students that are also like, no, I hate virtual. I prefer in-person. So that's like a big debate that I, I hear a lot. I think in-person has, has been all right. Um, a good number of the students are are willing to keep a mask on, which, which is much appreciated. My voice doesn't project well, so I've had to take mine off to teach and be heard. Um, so I appreciate when students kept theirs on as much as possible. Um, there is no room big enough for social distancing when you have a class of 200. Um, Let's see, oh. uh, Limits to what you can do. And developmental psychopathology next semester will be uh, in person for those of you who are interested. Theo, look, it's Mia. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. <laughs> Say hi to baby. Hola, baby. Hola. Como esta? Yeah, oh, look at her cute curly hair. Oh. You want to say join the TARDIS lab? <laughs> Join the TARDIS lab. Use cuteness. Que diga mama. Dale. No te calles. All right, she ran away. I can only hope. Not at that age. At 15 months, they stay passive. At her age. Oh, hold on. I have a tantrum to deal with. Does anybody have any other comments or questions? Um, and then professors, would y'all be able to send me, I know I have some of y'all's PowerPoints, um, 
And can y'all just forward them to me again so I can send it out to my members and then I'll be sharing the emails that y'all shared on here if that's okay with y'all. Sure, no problem. Sure, yes. And if y'all have the applications available yeah. later on, y'all can send them to me as well and I can forward them to all my members um, so they can take a look at those applications for the labs. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just teaching intro next semester for undergraduate, or if uh, you're really good at math, there's a PhD level course in Bayesian statistics. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Oh. Okay, yeah. Looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so thank you so much. Well, if you, Dr. Brown, if you want to like put more detail in your PowerPoint and then resend it to me, you can. It's like, no. <laughs> but yes, I'll, I'll do more work. That, that sounds great. Okay. I'll send you my revised one because I saw Ryan and, and and Joe's, and I was like, nope, mine was not good enough. So I was working on it during the their sessions. So I'll send you that. I thought we were only allowed two slides. So I, I was a little underwhelming compared to the other ones. So I apologize. <laughs> I, I didn't give much depth into what I'm looking at these days. It was still a great presentation, so. Oh, you have to say that. You're the host. <laughs> Thank you again for having Thank me, though. I appreciate it. I hope, I hope everyone finds, obviously, there's clearly several people with amazing expertise and exciting opportunities. Well, thank you so much. You know, have a good evening and thank you members for coming. Take care everyone. Well, thanks for Looking having me.